but uh, if we were, if we were to sum all that up, it, it, it's it's going to be that uh, there are various places that are going to be specially involved in the judgment that comes upon Judah uh, when when God visits the armies of the Assyrians and later on the Babylonians upon them. So we're not going to touch on those things so much this morning. We're going to focus our attention more on uh, these first, especially four verses of the chapter. Micah's prophecy, I believe, is very relevant to us today in uh, the year 2020. Um, Years ago, John Calvin, in his sermons, described the situation in Micah's day uh, like this. He said, God's church, in spite of her unbelief and rebellious nature against God, was boasting in his name, and that was her undoing. Now, when, when you read the history that surrounds Micah's prophecy, and it's identified there, uh, in the, as being in the time of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. When you read that history, it, it comes home to you that uh, J- Judah had turned her privileges, and they were very many and great privileges as the visible church in the world, she'd, she'd turned her privileges into presumption. They were saying... In effect, look, we've got God in our midst. We are the people of God. We're special. Indeed, we're so special that we can actually sin with a pretty good degree of confidence that we'll be okay. We can sin securely. But Micah comes with startling news in that context to a very presumptuous uh, people and he says, "Hear." This is verse two. Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord be witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of His place. That's startling in the context of what was happening in the visible church in Micah's time. So I say it's pretty relevant to us because uh, the the Christian churches of our day, um, and and we're right in the mix with this, uh, the the Christian churches of our day seem to be in a a very similar sort of a position. There's a great deal, and much of it good, but there's a great deal of religious activity. But there, there is, I think it's fair to say, there, there is only a small amount of the fear of the Lord. There's a lot of religious activity, but very little trembling uh, with, with a sense of awe at the majesty of God speaking in his word. We, we tend to live rather boldly in the face of God. The beliefs and sins of our age are sadly embraced uh, by many Christians and Christian churches. And all the while, we do tend to feel rather confident that God is with us and will bless us. Especially, I think, um, in the churches that have such a profound and rich heritage, like the, we might be small here, but, but we're part of a tremendously rich heritage in the Reformed and Presbyterian faith that God has worked in, in the world in history. So I'd say especially in churches like ours, where the gospel is preached, and God is worshipped with, with a sense of his majesty so that we, we, we don't want to add our own stuff into God's worship. We, we want to say, well, Lord, you tell us, and we'll do what you say. In, in churches like this, where the gospel is preached and worship is maintained, there's also the tendency to have all manner of corruption uh, ignored and in a sense swept under the carpet. And all the while we are pretty sure that God is with us and blesses us. 
Why? Because the temple of the Lord is among us. We're the Lord's people. So Micah is sent to proclaim a prophecy to Samaria and to Jerusalem. And the idea there is that these are the two capitals, first of the ten tribes, Samaria, Jerusalem, the capital of Judah and Benjamin. So you've got the people of God in their, in their, in their divided state. And Micah prophesies to both of them and he says, no, this, this will not work. Uh, God is coming forth and he's coming forth out of his place. He's coming forth out of the temple which you have boasted in, and he's going to judge you. So, so, so that's incredibly relevant uh, to us today uh, as part of the church in the world. And, we, and I hope, hopefully we can, we can think about this carefully, sensibly, but also pretty, pretty straight. And, uh, and, and we can do some assessing and uh, hopefully... Uh, some repenting as well. So let's look this morning at this theme which we have on the board. Behold, it comes straight out of verse 3. Behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place. And uh, verse 2 has also said, Let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. That's where he's coming from. So, we're going to look at this under that theme. Behold, he comes forth from his place. And, and first of all, we're going to think about what Judah was doing. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to call this first point a bottled up deity. So as if God's been bottled up inside his temple. And that's where he's got it. That's where he lives. That's where he should stay. So a bottled up deity. And then secondly, we're going to see how the Lord is telling them that he is actually coming forth. And, and, and we'll see thirdly and briefly that this is actually a very merciful warning before it takes place. It's a forewarning so that the children of God uh, might, only, might not only be prepared to, to meet him through repentance, but be equipped for what's coming. So first of all, let's look at this point, a bottled up deity. Now, I, I say here a bottled up deity because, and I use that word deity because no one who truly knows the living God could possibly think of him being bottled up into one place where he isn't actually present with me, so I should walk with him in fear, in a, in a sense of, of trembling awe. So we can't truly know God if we think he's bottled up. And that's quite instructive in its own way. But, but he says here, behold, he comes out of his place. He comes out of his holy temple, that is. So first of all, let's, let's see if we can't get our heads around this idea of the temple being the house or dwelling place of God. Because this is where I think the children of God went wrong in Micah's time. Remember how Solomon, as we read in Second Chronicles, had been given the task of building the house of God. You can see that in from First Chronicles chapter twenty-eight and following. And when 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 the temple had been completed, there's two visitations of God in special ways that come to that temple. Both of them are really quite significant. I've got to say that even though I've read my Bible so long, it had not really come home to me with any clarity that there was two times God filled the temple with the glory of his presence when it had been built. And the first one was when the sacrifices... I'm sorry, the first one was when the dedication and prayer was offered up and the second one was when the sacrifices were made. And uh, these two fillings of the temple were, were vivid examples of how uh, God, the covenant God, was, was coming to his people in and through Jesus Christ and the promise of him as he's coming. So it's all centred in Jesus Christ as he's promised and as he's reflected and, and, and in a sense revealed in the types in the in the temple. 
So Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God has received the promise of God and he's coming and he's going to redeem his people and now the temple reflects and, and shows him uh, in typical form. God will dwell with his people. God is present in that temple now on the mercy seat for Israel, the very centre of their life. He's going to make a way for them to be reconciled and to be blessed and to be drawn near to him through the satisfying of his justice against their sins. And it's going to be, it's going to unfold as the whole sacrificial system with the high priest and, 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 the, and the slaughtering of the sacrifices morning and evening and, and all the different sacrifices that he gives. It's all going to take place at this temple. And everybody in Israel is going to have to be confronted with this great reality. The only way I can come into the presence of the living God, me, the sinner, is through the blood of the substitute. That's what the priest will carry into the Holy of Holies and he'll carry me on his shoulders and over his heart and, and, and that will be my access. It's all designed, and we must not miss this, it's all designed to lock the children of God in the Old Testament up to faith in Christ to come as the law teaches them their sin in so many ways. It all is designed to, as it were, gather them up at the door of the temple to confess together our hope for time and eternity is in the blood of the Lamb and we're looking for Christ to come. That's so important. Now, as those great typical elements are put in place and as Solomon prays, under the inspiration of the Spirit, God comes and he fills that temple with his presence or rather with the sign of his presence. A thick cloud that just radiates with incredible brightness so that the people, the priests could not enter into it because it's so bright. God comes and he says, with this, with this sign of his presence, I'm here. <laughs> now, at, at that time, Solomon himself, as we read, acknowledged several things very clearly. First of all, that shabby little building made by men's hands, even though it be of pure gold, could not contain God. Now, we read that in chapter 6, verse 18, didn't we? The heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this little building. So he acknowledged that. Second thing, even the heaven of heavens themselves cannot contain God. So that Solomon, at the time of the dedication of the temple, even as it's filled with the presence of God, acknowledges that God is infinitely and gloriously beyond the limitations even of the whole of creation. The heaven of heavens, the vastest extents of the, of the universe that God has created do not contain God. There's an infinite immensity to God that is above and beyond everything that's got a creaturely limitation to it. Now, now that's not insignificant. That means when you think that through and you bring it home and it takes hold of your mind and soul that God cannot be contained somewhere where he's not going to be in contact with me. There's no place where God is not. And then the third thing that I think Solomon really does recognise at that time is that God being so high and lifted up in his glory cannot be thought about sensibly as seeing and hearing and judging except we understand he's above and, uh, and higher than us. So God is with us but God is also observing us. God sees us. God hears us. God is higher and he observes us. And then the fourth thing, as I've mentioned already, is that God 
had associated his name with the temple. His special presence as the God of covenant faithfulness and mercy is with the temple. And as a sign of what he's done, he forms that thick cloud of the brightest possible light and represents the, his presence as located there. So God's not limited there, but God's put his name there and God's put the sign of his presence there and the everywhere present God that the heaven of heavens cannot contain has said to his people, I'll have you come to me through the blood of the lamb and I'll have you come into my holy of holies carried on the high priest's shoulders. Wait for Jesus Christ to come. So when God did that, he didn't restrain himself. He didn't contain himself. He didn't draw his infinite immensity down inside the confines of a little building. No, indeed. Every prayer that was offered to God, prayed towards that temple, had to be offered in recognition that God would hear from heaven. And the idea, I, I believe, is that, is that as the child of Israel prayed, whatever corner of Judah they might be in or whatever little town they were in, whether they were following the sheep or herding the camels, when they, when they prayed to God, they prayed through that typical representation of Jesus Christ and the way of access to the God of heaven who's with them in every moment of every day. But, now here we go, Micah prophesied to a people who had a very wrong view of God and his relationship to them and their life. Now maybe they didn't get their doctrine wrong. I don't know. But they had externalised their religion. And they, and they boasted in themselves, like Calvin said, because of their special privileges. We have the temple of Jehovah when others do not, the Israelite could say. God is within the temple as our God when he's not with other nations, the Israelite could say. We have the temple. They do not. God is in his temple. God is with us. We are the people of God. We are special. Therefore, all is well. Now, it's very interesting that a little bit later on, the prophet Jeremiah would challenge that way of thinking and even their wording head on. This is what Jeremiah said to them in chapter 7, verse 4. He said, trust not in lying words. So in other words, don't say this and think that it's right. Don't, don't say this and think that it's right. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. That's what they were saying. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And in, in, in a little bit later in that same chapter, a few verses later, their overconfidence in their privileges Jeremiah said, has led them to say, we are delivered by God to do all these abominations. That's, that's what was happening. So they're looking at the temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Thank God we're so special. We are delivered to do all these abominations. And that's what's going on here in Micah. Look at chapter 3 and verse 11 of Micah just for a moment, if you've got your Bible there. The heads thereof, judge, he's talking now about the, the, the rulers of, of uh, Judah. The heads thereof judge for reward. They're corrupt. The priests thereof teach for hire. They just want to give the people what they want to hear. 
you, you, you pay me and I'll tell you whatever makes you happy. The profits thereof divine for money, yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Now that's what was going on. And that's what Mike is addressing. God's all bottled up in their minds. He's located in the temple. And because he's all bottled up, located and restrained, restricted to the temple, they in their lives can basically do whatever they like and it doesn't matter because they're special. They're the people of God. So under the guise of being special, they felt free to engage in any and, and every form of evil, which was rebellion against the ever-present God. They used God's holy place as sin's hiding place. That's the idea of it. Now that's pretty sad, isn't it? That's, that's, that's an awful and a parlous state to be in as the people of God in the world. But now let's for a moment bring this forward to our own day and see if we can't just give it a little bit of um, substance as, as something that's practically applicable to us. To do that, let's just notice here that when God comes forth, he says in verse 3, he's first of all going to come down and tread on the high places of the earth. Now what he's talking about there is he's going to begin with his judgment in principle, upon the leaders and the rulers. And, uh, and so as you go on, chapter 3, for example, you see the heads of Jacob and the princes are addressed first up. So he's going to begin there. So I think we can begin there too. So how would we apply this to ourselves? Well, this attitude of a bottled up God and people able to do uh, uh, what they like and, get, and it doesn't matter, would be a little bit like a session of your church today or perhaps your presbytery. Let's call it a reformed or Presbyterian church. The session or the presbytery is going about its business and it is actually acting corruptly. It's denying or perhaps hiding the whole truth and it's covering up sin or it's sheltering, sheltering the evildoer and afflicting the innocent in various ways. And uh, all the while, the men who are on that court of the church are in, that, in their hearts and thinking to themselves, well, we're special. God has restrained himself in his love towards us from seeing and hearing and judging us. God is in his temple, is the idea. God's bottled up by his own special love to us. And we may do what we please. And God will bless us as we continue to go about the practices of worship and keep everything in its outward order. God is in his temple and his temple is with us. That, that's the sort of thing that's, that's being talked about here, I think. So, so if that's happening, it may not be happening in our midst, but if that's happening, when the dirty work is done and the meeting is over and the men go to prayer because they're quite certain that due to their position as reformed elders in a reformed church where the gospel is preached and the means of grace are more or less purely maintained and practised, the wickedness that they just perpetrated doesn't really matter. It's not really noted by God. God's in his place. Why could I think like that? Obviously, if we see ourselves as a people singled out by God for his special favour, the true church, and we see ourselves as special uh, and we can come to the place if God's bottled up so his judgment will never touch on us, that he will always just overlook our sins. Well, I think perhaps, I don't want to be too controversial and get too 
too too sort of close, but but it is helpful for us to try and apply things, isn't it? Think perhaps of the the generationally reformed parent or parents, and they've got a very wayward and uh, rebellious and, and and wicked child. Now I know life's complex, and there's all sorts of reasons that we have to be careful around these things for sure. But let's let's just talk in in, in the bold, bold terms for a moment. Uh, this child knows what's right. There's there's no particular extenuating circumstances that you'd have to deal with to, to see as triggers and causes. Every, everything's been great, but the child just rebels against God. And the parents now look at the child and they say, we don't mind what you do or how you live. It troubles us a bit, but we can handle it. But please, just remember that you are special to God and be sure to keep attending church because if you do, all will be well because the sinners in this church are special to God. That, that sort of a thing. Now I know that it's, it's, it's very important for our children to continue to attend church. That's where the means of grace are. That's where the gospels preach. That's where sin's confronted. That's where a call for salvation is heard. That's the right place to be. But there's no safety in just being in a true church if God's all bottled up and our life is lived as if he didn't exist. And I've got lots of other examples, but we won't have them. You get the picture. So, so in, in this context, God's got his place. He dwells in his temple. And in this New Testament age, he's in heaven, but he's boxed up. And that's how he's going to stay. So while God has got his place and while he stays there, all is well. But it means that God is not involved in our life. He doesn't live with us. He's not with us as we walk and we talk, as we eat, while we work and interact with our workmates. He isn't there when we're relaxing or in our recreations. He isn't aware of our inner thoughts and of our lusts. He isn't there to know it all. And he can't assess it or judge it because he's in his box and he doesn't hold us personally accountable. He's in his temple and we're special and we get to do what we think is best and God will just go with it. That's the situation. And I think we can all resonate just a little bit with that. That's one of the great challenges of the visible church in the world in its generations is that God, little bit by little bit, gets located in his box. Well, Micah says, the Lord is coming forth. That's a startling message. That God is about to break out of their imaginary box and he is about to visit their sins with a just punishment. He will bear witness to them, Micah says, from his holy temple. And that's so significant. Everything about that temple, as we've already alluded to in part, as the habitation of God bears witness to the fact that God's people, if they're going to live with him, need to be very really and personally separated to the love of God from their sins. It's not true what the people were thinking in Jeremiah's time. God had not redeemed them so that they could sin. Everything about the temple shows that. And God's witnessing now from his temple. He's coming out and he's talking to them and he's going to deal with them on the basis of what the temple itself represented. Think of the Holy of Holies in the temple, the very heart of it, where God dwelt on the mercy seat with the with the cherubim stretching over 
and the whole picture as Isaiah later would say it, and, and he'd say that the the angels are there before this thrice holy God with their faces covered saying holy 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 Lord God almighty the earth is full of your glory that that holy of holies yeah they could only enter there through the veil through the blood and by the high priest once a year They, they dare not enter any other way into the presence of God. The, the very temple itself said, no, no, not in your sins, not apart from the blood. The, the temple itself said, don't, don't, brethren, don't you dare try to enter another way. Don't you understand that the fellowship with God, that that, that your whole life testifies to as a child of God stands the other side of the veil. It's a redeemed life. It's purchased by the blood of the Lamb. That's what the temple says. And the whole sacrificial system that's, that's, that's gathered up around it, that's so much integral to it, with its priesthood, with its altar, with its consuming fire from God that came down from heaven at the dedication of that temple. With the substitute that's, that's sacrificed in the place of the guilty. All these things witness to God's, now, now catch this, they witness to God's absolute intolerance toward the least sin and God's hatred of sin and the fact that God will destroy it. And God provides the substitute and pours out his wrath upon that substitute, destroys sin in the substitute for the people of God. That's all testified to by the temple. And it's impossible, it is utterly, utterly impossible for the child of God to look at that with understanding and say, it therefore does not matter how I sin. It's impossible. It's just a flat out contradiction. So that's what the temple witnessed to. And the Lord is coming out of the temple and he's bringing this witness and this testimony with him. And it says that he's going to be He's going to come forth from his place. He'll come down and he'll tread upon the high places of the earth. He's going to bring the judgment now upon the people who, by their very life, testimony and witness, showed themselves to be outside of Jesus Christ and to have not have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that's in him. And, they, and his God is going to deal with them according to their works. Now, that's an awesome reality. Outside of Jesus Christ and outside of the atonement and the blood and the reconciliation and the new life that he has for us, there is only judgment. And that's what God is going to bring out of the temple. So, brethren, that's so important for us. We, we like those people in Judah, really do need to be saved from our sins. And, uh, and what I'm thinking of here is, 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 is that we ourselves personally, in our own experience, have the redemption that's purchased by Christ applied to us so that we personally, that I, turn from my sins as a converted person to believe into Jesus Christ alone for my salvation and to have God through Christ take hold of my life so that he is with me in every minute detail and moment of it from daylight till dark and when I go to bed and when I close my eyes and when I sleep and when I dream and when I wake up in the morning, there's not a moment of my life that is not completely gathered up into and redeemed in the blood of the Lamb and brought into the presence of God. God is with me. That, that sort of a life. It's not possible to have Jesus Christ as a Saviour without he's also our Lord. 
and he's with us. In fact, wonder of wonders, the living God comes to indwell us by his Holy Spirit. And it's not possible for the Holy Spirit to lead us in the ways of unholiness. So the living God who had so long restrained himself in his forbearing and had been sending the prophets and speaking to them, to the people with warning, is about to bring the witness out of the temple. He will come forth, he will come down, and he'll begin with the heads of the people and his judgment will spread out and, 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 it, will, and it will gather up the whole of the nation and, uh, and it will start with the places where the apostasy and the idolatry first came into Judah out of Israel, those little towns, and it's going to go from there and it's going to go right across to the Philistines and everybody in between from the head down to the toe is going to experience what it means to have the awesome God, the living God, who's holy, come out of the temple. I don't know when that's going to happen again, but Jesus Christ is about to come from heaven, isn't he? I don't, I don't know when that will be. Some Christians sort of speculate that it can't be now. It's got to be after this, this, this and this. I, I don't believe that for a moment. I believe that each, each one of us as Christians ought to live as if today the Lord Jesus Christ could come from heaven, come out of his temple and deal with us according to the reality of our life. As a very merciful forewarning, Micah is prophesying before the judgment comes. The judgment is set, the Lord is coming. Uh, as he says there, the wound is incurable. The judgment is definitely coming, but before the judgment comes, the, pro the prophet is sent and he gives this warning. And uh, it's going to do two things, isn't it? Uh, as, as it sounds in the midst of Israel and Judah, because Israel's just about carried away into captivity at this moment, but as it continues to sound in Judah, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to come into the hearer because it will be heard by all. And some people who hear it will say, no, that, that's not going to happen. That's not the way it is. Just like in Second Peter, remember, from the time of our fathers, things have continued the way that they are. God, God doesn't do that. God doesn't, God doesn't act like that. Now, we have not seen it in our generation. Mum and dad didn't see it. Our grandparents didn't see it. No, that won't happen. And so it, it gets shed off the mind and, we, and people shake off the hand of God from their shoulder and they say, no, our God doesn't deal like that with us. We're special. And they go on in their sins, but their sins are greatly increased because they heard, but they didn't heed. And as they go on in their sins and the judgment takes hold of them or they die in their sins, they, they will meet that God outside of Christ and be judged. But there's also another marvellous work of God that comes in mercy, isn't there? That when the prophet comes with his word, it's also going to come to the children of God, to those who are chosen unto eternal life with power and it's going to reach down through their minds and into their hearts and it's going to convict them of their sin and it's going to, it's going to actually stir them up so that before the judgment comes, they do something utterly, utterly incredible. They repent. Now, that's a work of God's grace. That's a gift of God, repentance. It's an incredible, glorious gift of God that the children of God all get it. And it comes to them in the context of the word, just like we hear in this morning. It, it, it starts to rattle our mind and it, it, it shakes us up and we start to think to ourselves, well, wait a minute. Things are not the way they ought to be. 
And if God does come out of his temple to me, what will be my condition? What, what will he find? And the Holy Spirit goes to work. And that becomes a burden. And we're convicted and we're convinced. And we actually repent. The attitudes that we had change. The conduct that we were engaged in changes. And we come by God's grace in Jesus Christ and through his blood into the presence of the holy God as redeemed, washed in the blood, forgiven, justified, accepted. And we humbly say to our God and Father, help me. Give me the grace. Teach me. Lead me. Show me the way. Because I tremble. I tremble at your word when I think of you coming out of the temple. I want to be ready. Amen. Let's pray.